Let's imagine it's 1986 and you have a PC. Now, we didn't call them uh, MS-DOS computers back then. We called them IBM compatibles. Unless, of course, you had a real IBM and in that case, you just, you just had an IBM. But anyway, uh, what were your sound options back then? 99% of PCs only had what we referred to as the PC speaker. Yes, this is the speaker that could produce square wave tones that we're all familiar with. So, how did that work? So, you had these various components like the CPU, RAM, and video chips. And you had I.O. ports like the keyboard serial and parallel ports. And you had the PC speaker. Now, the CPU can read and write to the RAM and then send that information along to, say, the video or one of the I.O. controllers. Or it can send that information to the PC speaker, or more accurately, to the system timer, which controls the speaker. Once the frequency of the tone has been set in the timer, it will continue to make that tone without the CPU being involved. In many ways, you can think of the PC speaker as a one-voice sound synthesizer that can only produce square waves. Some programmers even made the speaker sound pretty good by alternating the tones very quickly, giving the illusion of more than one voice. And some games even managed to produce digital samples using the PC speaker. But since it is a 1-bit sound device, it doesn't sound that great. But the real problem with producing digital samples is that the CPU has to read every byte from RAM and precisely control every tick of the PC speaker, thus hogging up almost all of the CPU time for producing this sound. A few years later with cards like the Sound Blaster, they had something called DMA, which meant that the CPU could simply give one instruction to the sound card telling it where the sample was in memory, and the sound card could handle the task of reading that sample from memory and playing it on its own while the CPU could go back to its own tasks. But then this curious thing came out in 1986 called the Kovax speech thing for the IBM PC. Of course, Kovax was making sampling devices for other computers back then, such as uh, this Kovax Voice Master for the Commodore 64. But I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't have the Kovax device or the speech thing for the IBM PC. In fact, they're virtually impossible to find. They're very rare. However, I recently received a donation of a modern clone of the Kovax called the CVX4. And so I'll be demonstrating this instead of the original Kovax. And since I'll need a computer to demonstrate it on, I thought this old 46 laptop would be perfect since it has no sound card built in and there's virtually no other way to get a sound card in it, at least that'll work with DOS games. So I'll connect my little Kovax clone here. And I'll need something to hear the sound with, so I'll use my 1980s boombox. But since I want you guys to be able to hear this clearly, I'll pipe the sound through my Zoom H4n to record the audio for you guys. So how does the Kovax work? Well, the parallel port in IBM compatible has many pins, but eight of these can be controlled at will by the CPU. These are essentially general purpose I.O. pins, but if you use them together, you can create an 8-bit value. And the Kovax is nothing more than an 8-bit digital to analog converter that takes these eight lines and converts it to analog voltage, or essentially a line level audio signal. So, in many ways, it works pretty similar to the PC speaker, only it's connected to the I.O. chip, and the CPU will still have to work hard to move the information from RAM one byte at a time. But at least it is 8 bits instead of 1 bit like the PC speaker. So, how does it sound? Back in the DOS days, there was kind of an obsession with these Amiga Mod Tracker files, and this program was one of many that could play them on DOS machines. First, I'll configure it to use the PC speaker and let you have an idea of what this sounds like. Because it is so faint, I'll have to put my microphone right up to the speaker to capture it. You can cycle through different screens while the music is playing. Okay, now let's configure the program to use the Kovax and try it again. Well, that sure sounds a lot better to me. Even Kitty approves. So considering this thing relied entirely on the CPU, and CPUs weren't even all that fast in 1986, what was it really used for? Well, that's a good question, and I haven't been able to find a solid answer on that just yet. I did find a magazine article where somebody was asking about a software program for digitized speech, and the magazine responded about the speech thing being used for digitized words to be incorporated into basic programs. The earliest game I can find that uses the device is 688 Attack Sub, but it didn't come out until 1989. 
So my guess is, uh, just like the uh, C64 version of the Kovacs products, uh, they probably had their own little suite of software that came with the original speech thing. But as time went on, uh, more and more games started to support the Kovacs as a sound device. And one of the big advantages it had was its price. In 1987, the AdLib synthesizer came out at $195. And the Sound Blaster came out a couple of years later at 235 but you could buy a Kovac speech thing for 79 bucks. And while price was in its favor, the big problem was the complexity of coding required in order to make it work. Uh, so basically any game that were to use it uh, would require a very precisionly timed software routines in order to be able to produce sound and also run the game at the same time. Plus the older machines weren't all that fast to begin with, so they didn't have a lot of extra CPU cycles to begin with. In fact, if you look at Moby Games, you can see that only 55 games were known to support the Kovac speech thing. In 1991, a competing device came onto the market known as the Disney Sound Source. This product works in a similar way, but sold for a very aggressive $14 and was even bundled with different games such as this game, The Rocketeer. So let's unbox this and see how it was all packaged. The box unfortunately has seen better days. Okay, so here's the parallel port connector, and here's the little speaker. And dang, the box almost looks empty, but they've hidden the floppy disk down in this little pocket here. It also comes with some little wheel. My guess is this is some sort of copy protection device where it asks you to find some information to start the game. So let's take a closer look at this thing. This is really where the action happens. This contains the digital to analog converter, and it has a pass-through connector so you could connect your printer. That way you don't completely give up your parallel port to this thing. This part here is essentially just a little amplifier with a built-in speaker. You can sort of see a Mickey Mouse outline on the speaker, which makes sense being a Disney product. It does run off of batteries, which is sort of annoying, but it does automatically shut itself off when not in use by any software. It also has a headphone jack. So the big question is, was the Disney sound source any kind of improvement over the Kovax? Well, the answer is yes and no. It has uh, one big advantage and then one huge disadvantage. Now, the big advantage is that it contains a small FIFO buffer. Let me explain how that works. With the Kovacs unit, the CPU has to time the flow of bytes perfectly, thus chewing up a lot of the CPU's time. With the sound source, there's a buffer so the CPU can send the same information, but it can do it erratically at its leisure, and the buffer will output a steady stream of sound data to the DAC. And while this is not as good as the direct memory access we talked about with a sound card, this buffer does remove a huge burden from the CPU and the programmer uh, because timing is no longer as important. So this, combined with uh, Disney's better marketing of the product, meant that the sound source got a lot more support from games. And you can see that Moby Games lists 131 games that supported the sound source. Now, that's still a small number compared to something like the AdLib, which had over 1,600 titles supporting it, but a lot better than the Kovax. So what was the huge disadvantage I was talking about? Well, with the Kovax, the frequency can be anything you desire because it's entirely up to the CPU to handle timing. Uh, thus, as you can see when playing this mod file, it's running at 44 kilohertz. However, uh, with the Disney sound source, it's up to this buffer to determine the output frequency, and it's fixed at a measly 7 kilohertz. So let's connect the sound source and have a listen. I'll have to use a different mod player that will support the sound source, but here we go. The bass isn't bad, but the treble is terrible. Compare that with the Kovax again. And now the sound source. Also, the little speaker isn't great either. Compare with the uh, sound from my boombox. So the Disney sound source was really meant more for, you know, sound effects and a little extra speech and stuff like that uh, to be integrated into software or games more than it was meant for actual music. And, you know, it, it did pretty well for sound effects and speech. 
But really, what good is one of these today? Because anybody who has an old MS-DOS computer uh, could probably easily afford a, you know, an actual Sound Blaster or compatible card to put into it. Um, well, uh, the big advantage uh, for me anyway is uh, when I'm wanting to use these old laptops like this one because it doesn't have a sound device of any kind and there's no way to put one in there. Now, granted, only about 15% of the games out there actually support one of these devices. So the first thing I want to do is I want to show you some games that natively support either the Kovacs or the Disney Sound Source, and uh, I'm going to be using this laptop. No emulator. I want you to actually see and hear exactly what it sounds like. The first one I'm going to show you is one of my all-time favorites, Duke Nukem 3D. Now, this game would have absolutely no sound or music of any kind on this laptop normally, but it supports the Disney Sound Source for sound effects only. So while there's no music, the game is certainly more enjoyable to play like this. The next game I'll show you is Prince of Persia. This game normally just has PC speaker sound effects on this laptop, but with the Disney Sound Source, it's also much more fun to play. Pinball Fantasies actually supports the Co-Box, and it actually sounds absolutely fantastic. Okay, so those are some examples of games that supported either one or the other, and that seems to be what I'm finding, is that uh, games support one or the other, but not generally both of these devices. But now I want to show you a way to get even more games to support the Kovax. A few years ago, somebody wrote a Tandy three-voice sound emulator that works with the Kovax. So once you load that into memory, you can start a game such as Tetris Classic. So I'll pick VGA, and when it asks what kind of sound, you can see that number nine here shows Tandy three-voice sound, so I'll pick that. The game complains that it can't detect it, but if you ignore the message, it works anyway. So the Tandy sound system is fairly primitive, but that's probably why it was chosen as it would be much less CPU intensive to emulate, and it seems to work well. This is uh, much more fun to play than using the PC speaker sound. And here's Populous using the Tandy sound. And here's Ultima 6 using Tandy Sound. Now Ultima still always plays the sound effects through the PC speaker, and it even does that with other sound cards too. It tends to only use the sound card for music, and since my recording is only catching the music, you can't hear the sound effects here. If you look at Moby Games, there are 432 games that supported Tandy Sound, so that opens up a lot more games that can now have sound. Okay, so I tried a lot of software using the Tandy emulator, and I found that about half of the software just flat out wouldn't work, mostly because it wouldn't detect the presence of a Tandy sound card. Now, uh, the reason for this is that a lot of the older games, the way that they would detect for the Tandy was to check the computer's BIOS to see if the word Tandy was somewhere in the BIOS. Uh, that's because Tandy computers were the only ones that actually shipped with that hardware, uh, so that was an, an easy way to check for the device. Uh, and since this emulator only emulates the hardware, and doesn't change the code in the system BIOS, uh, the, f many of the software simply fail to detect that it's there, and there's no easy fix for that. Still, between the natively supported games and the games that will work with the Tandy emulator, that's a pretty large selection of games that can now have sound on this machine using a simple device like this. And there's one more thing I haven't shown you. Believe it or not, almost all of the Sierra Adventure games can be made to work. Somebody recently created a new driver that you can copy into the folder of Sierra games, and it supports a special four-voice mode. 
It doesn't sound fantastic, in fact it kind of resembles the Tandy emulator. Keep in mind these voices are essentially created real time in software, so they can't be too fancy. Nevertheless, I can now play these games with some music. Normally, a game like this has no music at all, um, only some like beep-like sound effects from the PC speaker. So between the native support, the Tandy emulator, and all of the Sierra games, there are now many hundreds of games that can have sound on this old 486 laptop, even though it doesn't officially support any sound card. You know, so that's pretty cool. So if you're into old laptops like I am, then uh, this is definitely um, an inexpensive device that uh, would definitely give some better sound to your old laptop. And um, I'll put a link down in the description field of where you can buy one of these. And no, I'm not making any money off this, but uh, I think there's a lot of other vintage enthusiasts out there that would probably enjoy getting their hands on one of these. Uh, so that's it for this time. So um, thanks for watching and stick around till next time.